What's going on everybody? Welcome to yet another Q&A. In this Q&A I'm going to be answering kind of a handful of uh, relatively unrelated questions. But first, I got the hoodies in from the Indiegogo campaign. And here is one. Nice. Much better. So the first question I got here is, which mobile operating system to use, Android or iOS, and why? I love how you just assume I don't use BlackBerry or Windows, but you're correct. Um, I use Android, but it really has very little to do with the operating system itself, and really more to do with the actual phones uh, that run those operating systems. So to me, I think the best word to use is that Android is just more fair. So for just some examples, um, if I need to replace the battery, okay, on my Android devices, all I do is pop off the back, I pop out the battery, I put in a new one, no problem. I need more storage, I just get a micro SD card, pop it in. Um, these things are not possible on the iOS, like Apple phones, uh, and that just drives me nuts. I also, when I buy the phone, I think paying like an extra $100 or $200 or something for like 32 gigabytes more of storage is just, it's just, outrageous. It's unfair in my opinion. So um, that's why I don't use iOS phones. Uh, but my wife has always used Apple phones. And I mean, they're great products. So I don't mind the operating system. Uh, the only thing, the other thing I kind of noticed is Android phones, at least the ones that I've owned, typically seem to last longer than Apple phones. But again, that's totally anecdotal. So who knows? Like I said, I mostly just use Android because I think it's a more fair phone. That's all. Uh, the next question, if someone has an idea for an app but uh, doesn't know how to code but's willing to learn how to code to make it happen, would it be better for this person to learn to code or like hire someone uh, or like a coding company to do it for them even if they're worried that the idea could be stolen? Well, there's really kind of two parts here. One is like an idea being stolen. So for the most part, ideas are pretty worthless. It's all about execution. Uh, when it comes to an app or something like this, uh, the app itself generally is the execution. So, I mean, it, it is a, a realistic threat, but also it's really, it's a lot deeper than that. So you'll, you'll never be able to like make a website or a web app and just be like once and done. So you can't just like pay someone $10,000 for a website and then, and think that's the end of it. There's always going to be development that's required. So... I'm not really sure I would ever suggest to somebody to hire like an outside company. You'd either want to hire someone to work for you or with you um, or or do it yourself. I'm more of a do-it-yourselfer, so if it was me, I would just learn how to do it. Um, but there's some things I don't learn how to do because I don't want to or I don't enjoy it. So, for example, um, plumbing or something like that in the house. Um, I'm going to just hire someone to do that because I don't get any enjoyment out of that. And then the same thing is like... Uh, I do most of the work on my car, so if I need to change the brakes or the oil or something like that, I'll do it. But if I need to rebuild an engine or something, I'm going to get a professional to do that. So it really just kind of depends. But in your case, I'd probably say either do it yourself or find someone who shares your vision and become partners. Uh, I would rarely suggest to get a coding company to make you an app because you're basically setting yourself up, in my opinion, for trouble down the line. Either you're going to fail and it won't matter, or if you're successful, you're going to now be dependent on that company. Uh, or have to find someone who's going to work on that, like, it's not totally legacy code, but someone else's code. Anyway, moving on. Next question from Dro Loud with the avatar to match. Hey, Centex, I'm interested in IT security and pen testing. Which language should I look into? Currently learning Python at the moment. Uh, first of all, I'm not really a pen tester or IT security guy, so I'm probably not the greatest person to ask, but Python's a good language. But in terms of what languages you should learn, like all of them really because you're going to be having to deal with any like pen testing it just depends on what what kind of systems are you pen testing and what's on those systems so um, really a lot more than probably just python but python's a great scripting language that is i know happens to be used in pen testing um, a library you might be interested in is pwn tools p-w-n-t-o-o-l-s it's a python library so if you're interested in learning pen testing with python you might want to look at that exploit library Anyway, that's all I'm going to say on that. Moving along, um, got a comment here. It's kind of long, so I'm going to paraphrase. But basically, it's just, hey, yeah, I would like to have basically a tutorial or stream covering basically from beginning to end of a Kaggle challenge like uh, here is referenced, the Titanic data set. Um, yeah, it's totally possible. I'm not sure I would stream it necessarily to go all the way through, but I might stream something like that. My goal with the streams is actually to keep them relatively short, and I might even just do streams 
as my main way to record content from now on and just stream the recording of that content, except for like some things which just feedback from people is absolutely pointless. But then when I do film the streams, if you happen to be there for the stream, then you get to kind of participate in the filming. So everything's still kind of up in the air with the stream, so I'm not really sure how I'm gonna do it just yet, but that's kind of where I'm leaning at the moment. But anyway, uh, running through a full Kaggle competition, for example, um, or at least challenge or whatever is totally possible. The second part of this question is about the Udacity self-driving car um, nano degree and uh, that first challenge. So actually I was going to work with Udacity on that self-driving car nano degree and got all the way through to the very end and, and then when it came time to sign contracts, it just fell kind of fell, fell apart at the end based on just money. Uh, that's a paid course. It's an expensive paid course, and I felt like the payment for a person who was going to be contractor and consulting on that, my job was going to be to create projects basically and deal with that code. And I felt like for someone doing self driving car programming, that that rate was. Uh, too low. <laughs> Unacceptable. I'm sure some people, someone took it and it's a great resume builder. I'm sure if like, if you want a resume builder, I just, I didn't, I, I thought working on the course would be cool. But anyway, um, that's not your question. Anyways, uh, I actually did that first challenge as a sort of like prove your worth uh, thing. And I, I did finish the challenge. I bet I know exactly what you're stuck on. It's uh, at least for me, what I was like when I, I hit kind of a block initially was draw straight lines. <laughs> so um, that one took me, it took me probably like an hour or something to figure that one out because um, I didn't know how to draw the straight line over the uh, lane, but I, I did figure it out. Uh, my way is kind of hacky, but it actually, it still works with the frames per second and stuff. And it's not absolutely horrendous. So anyway, yeah, maybe I could cover that. I'm not sure I could use their exact video, but there's tons of open source videos uh, that I could use that for. So the next question here is how do you decide what topic your videos are going to be on? So the way that I usually do this is it's just something that I'm personally interested in. So either I just got done working on something and I want to share it with everybody or um, I'm interested in learning something. So I'll learn it and teach it purely just to learn it. <laughs> uh, so um, it's either usually one of those two things. I also take requests uh, or suggestions on certain modules or topics or whatever to cover. And uh, I do that not necessarily because I like tally it up and then go with what the majority wants. I generally do that just to become aware of new things that I haven't even heard of um, at the time. So um, yeah, so that's pretty much how I, how I decide on what kind of content to cover. So the final question I'm gonna answer here is your Twitter profile tells you are an introvert. How did you prepare yourself to appear in video tutorials or public facing is something you're comfortable with? Basically, how do I reconcile having such a public facing um, job, I suppose, uh, with being an introvert. So for those of you not familiar with my Twitter, I just have on there, it's like INTJ. That's my, my, my Briar Miggs uh, classification. I can't think of the proper term. Anyway, uh, yeah, so INTJ and part of the I there is introverted. And I think that probably the, the biggest thing here is there's maybe a, a slight misconception on what introvert actually means. Um, introvert doesn't necessarily mean antisocial, but at the same time, I wouldn't con I wouldn't confuse uh, running a YouTube channel as being a social activity. Certainly not in the sense of uh, that you might initially think. Because I mean, the reality of the situation is I'm sitting in my room and I'm talking to a webcam. Yeah, it's going to reach like thousands of people, but at the same time, it's a very uh, a very personal thing for me. Like I'm not actually having to engage with 5,000 people. I mean, it, that's what will happen, but at the same time, it's uh, it's very different. But also, even even then, uh, a lot of like public speakers and like leaders, like company CEOs, stuff like that, are actually introverts and will identify as introverts. Uh, and, and the difference is, um, I guess the relationship with your audience or coworkers or whatever it might be. So for example, like a, a good example is indeed like a public speaker who's okay with like speaking to say a huge audience of hundreds of people and that's okay. But then getting off stage and then having to interact with those hundreds of people at the same time, that's very uh, demanding for an introvert. Okay. So uh, another good way to think of it is like an introvert is someone who is drained by social interaction and an extrovert, someone who actually like gets energy from a social interaction. So for like me personally, I'd much more rather converse and hang out with a small group of people, like two or three people. Uh, whereas I like my wife likes to have like 20 people over or something like that. And whenever I get in like big groups of people, I tend to just like sit back and just like 
listen to what everyone's saying. Like I, I very rarely take part in a conversation that large. It's just not enjoyable to me as much. Um, I don't mind sitting back and listening. Um, but it's definitely like that. I think that's just like a trait of, of being introverted. Also, I'm not a psychologist. Um, I get that number or that, uh, you know, INTJ classification just from taking like a test that basically tells you, um, you can find them online and stuff. They're like, they're pretty long and it's like a hundred something question test or something, <laughs> but it's kind of cool. Uh, anyway, um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, basically I, I just, I don't really consider a YouTube channel as something that extroverts tend to do. I think this is a great example, like where I feel like in this setting, yeah, I reach a large group of people, but it's yet a fairly personal setting, at least for me. Um, I'm, I'm filming in my own house and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, that's it for the Q and a, the next Q and a is going to be on artificial intelligence. I've been asked artificial intelligence questions since the very first Q and a, and I've been kind of putting it off because I, it's going to take basically an entire Q and a, uh, to really answer that question. And, and really, I won't even really truly answer the question, but, um, there are a few things that I think are relatively unique on my thoughts on what the real true threat of AI is. And it's not what most people seem to think it is. So, um, I'd be happy to share that with you. If you have any AI specific, uh, questions, now would be the time to ask. Um, otherwise you can ask other questions too, and I'll get to them, not in the next one, but the one right after that. Uh, so this next one should be on, I think the 31st. So I do think that there are questions of AI that will be of utmost importance, especially for the year 2017, just watching kind of what has happened in 2016 and what we're what we're headed towards. So anyway, some pretty serious issues in my opinion. Uh, but anyway, um, that's what we'll be talking about in the next video. Questions, comments below. I'll see you in another video.